Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Try that again. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Louder. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Is he? Are you absolutely sure? Were you there? Did you see it with your own eyes? The Gospel of John, as Amy just read, sets the scene. The disciples were huddled in a house. They were huddled together and afraid, and the doors to the house were locked because they had lost their leader. The government took their leader, stripped him naked in front of everyone. They mocked him. They hung him up on a cross like an ordinary criminal. They hung him up to die. They had lost their leader. They had lost their hope. They had lost their reason to continue their work, their reason to live. So they locked themselves up in a house, and they locked down their hearts. And that was supposed to be the end of the story. The end. That's it. Done. Finished. And Mary Magdalene comes to them early. I have seen him. He is risen, just as he promised. But the disciples did not believe her. It had been the end. They were locked up, anxious, waiting for the sun to blot out, for their breath to cease. And Jesus came to them with his arms outstretched. Peace be with you. And he showed them the wounds that the world had created, the wounds that they had created. And our text says, in what has to be one of the biggest understatements of the Bible, the disciples rejoiced. And he breathed on them. He breathed on them like God in Genesis breathed on those first people and filled their lungs. He breathed on them that breath that smells of sweet honey and Easter lilies. That spirit. And they believed. And Jesus gives them their mission in that same breath, that sweet breath. Jesus commissions the disciples to practice forgiveness, to live as a reconciling people. To go out into the world to undo debts, to unclench their fists, to release grudges. But Thomas wasn't there. Who knows where he was? Perhaps he was out finding something to eat. Perhaps he had gone back to work. Perhaps he was ready to put this whole terrible drama behind him. And when he returned, they said, Thomas, he's back. Just as he promised, we've seen him. He didn't believe. If I can't touch his wounds, if I can't smell the anointing oils of his body, if I can't see the scar on his side, I cannot believe. And the next week, Jesus comes to them again, the doors still locked, because apparently Thomas wasn't the only one who doubted. And Jesus appears again, and he goes right to Thomas, peace be with you. Put your finger here. See my sides, reach out your hand, put it in my side. My Lord and my God, Thomas says. I have to admit, I love Easter Sunday. I love to sing Christ the Lord is risen today. I love the hats and the bow ties. I love the sweet scent of Easter lilies. I love that rich taste of Easter candy that I've given up for 40 days. I love the taste of savory ham. I love to read in scripture the moment the angel declares, He is not here, he is risen. And I love when the congregation exclaims, He is risen indeed. I love Easter Sunday. But on the Monday following Easter, the realities of this world seem to set in. War and poverty, disease and heartache. On Monday, we read about terrorism that took the lives of 72 in Pakistan. We learned about a wor worsening heroin crisis in New England. We saw that economic inequality is taking its toll on the most vulnerable among us. On Tuesday, perhaps, we learned that a dear friend has been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Another friend shares that they are coming to the end of their relationship. 
On Wednesday, a plane is hijacked and the report is released outlining the heart-wrenching truth of, that the poor physical health of those in our lowest economic class in our society is worsening. And our week continues, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. By the Sunday after Easter, by today, it becomes a bit more difficult to exclaim, Christ is risen. It becomes more difficult to shout out, Alleluia. On this Sunday after Easter, we meet Thomas, doubting Thomas. The one who had a difficult time believing. And who can blame him? Thomas was a witness to a haunting, gruesome scene. And then was asked to believe that everything was made right again. No easy task. It makes sense then that Thomas asked to see the wounds. His hand and his side. He asked to see relics of something quite real that he had witnessed. He was asked to believe in the resurrection. Asked to believe that Jesus walked the earth again. And instead of responding at first with great jubilation, with excitement, with Christ the Lord is risen, with Alleluia, he pauses. He stumbles. He doubts. Perhaps you've had a similar experience. Upon revealing that I am not only a minister, but a Christian minister, the question I always receive in response to that, do you believe in the resurrection? And I don't know what to say. In these moments, I feel I'm the apologetic for the Christian faith. That I alone, in this conversation, hold all of the responsibility to defend you. To defend the people of the Christian faith and the Christian tradition around the world. Of course, they mean, do you believe that Jesus Christ, who had died, rose from the tomb and lived again? And the truth is, I don't know. Do I believe that Jesus Christ's body, which had lost all life, was resuscitated, filled with breath and being, and he walked the earth again? I don't know. Do I believe that some divine presence that our God has the power to raise to life those who were yet dead? I don't know. Like Thomas, it would be helpful for me to see Jesus Christ alive and well, bearing the wounds of his death. It would be helpful for me if medical experts and scientists would come out and say, yes, it is possible to be dead for days and still have your lungs filled with breath, your heart beat again, and live. It would be helpful for me if others, if those whom I knew, who rejoice upon another shore, rose from their tombs and lived. You see, if I am being asked, if I believe that a human body can be drained of all life and in three days resume its vigor, I don't know. But if I am being asked, if I believe in resurrection, there is no doubt. Yes. And this is what I say to those who ask if I believe in resurrection. I tell them about the early church about those early Christians, those who gathered once a week before the sun rose to break bread and hear the stories of God in Scripture. I tell them about how those early Christians, against all odds, kept their communities going, their tradition alive. I tell them about church reformers, those who, when it felt like the church had grown to too large and gone astray, they risked it all, even their lives, so that, that the church might be renewed, that the church might die and rise again. I tell them about Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King Jr. I tell them of people who refused to let the movement for justice and dignity die, those people who bore the burdens and the wounds, who in every time it appeared that hatred won, that the movement was dead and buried, it rose again and lives today. I tell them about changing tides and how the church around the world is rising to new life, opening their hearts to welcome gay and lesbian and transgender children into houses of God. I tell them about King's Chapel, 
I tell them about how after the revolution this place nearly vanished, then something strange happened, something new and curious, something that inaugurated a tradition of reason and mystery and beauty. And this place lived again. I tell them about us today. I tell them that despite the news reports of declining church attendance and membership, we are headed in a different direction. This place lives. And I tell them about you. I tell them that by your stories, by your examples, by your songs, perhaps even by your wounds, you have shared glimpses of profound resurrection. You see, the resurrection is less of a belief, less of a philosophical argument. It is an identity. It is who we are. It is what defines us, what we practice. Resurrection is not a period at the end of a statement or a grand theological benediction, or a counter-argument to reason. It is an overture. It is a prelude, a beginning to the Christian life. Bearing wounds and scars, yet do we live. Resurrection is the living out of the human experience as God, as that great mystery, fashioned it. To fall and to stand. To stumble and to soar. To die and to rise. So ask me, do I believe in resurrection? And I will tell you yes, a thousand times over, yes. How do I know? I've seen it. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Amen.